Welcome to the Engine Room Podcast, where host coach Aaron Sloan and Julie Watson explore the world of boxing through the lens of sport, culture, and science from the Engine Room Boxing Gym in the heart of downtown Tulsa. Our guest today is singer-songwriter, artist, and former professional boxer Paul Thorne. Paul grew up in Mississippi. The son of a preacher, he spent most of his childhood in church where he developed his love of music, steeped in the gospel sound while he hid his Huey Lewis and Elton John albums from his father. As a young man, Paul learned to box from his uncle. He eventually turned pro with 14 professional fights to his name, including a televised match against four-time world champion Roberto Duran. In this episode, Paul talks about the sport of boxing and his fight with Duran. And as a bonus for music fans, he also performs two of his original songs, including one off his upcoming album. Hi, Paul. Welcome to the Engine Room Podcast. Thanks I'm for joining so us today. I'm happy to be here. How y'all doing today? Oh, we're doing great. Um, Good. So uh, I, I read a little bit of uh, read a little bit of your bi- biography and uh, caught up on you a little bit. Man, there's a lot to talk about. I think you've done you've done a lot of stuff. So. Um, I don't know that we'll be able to cover everything in here today, but, um, you know, we're, we're a boxing podcast, so we obviously want to hear about, um, your, your boxing past at some point in time, but, um, we want to, we want to talk to you about your music and, uh, and hear you play hopefully today too. You got your guitar there ready for us. So we're, we're very excited about that. Well, thank you. You know, I'm excited to, to be talking about boxing because I love boxing. I'm, uh, I just, I've got four cardboard boxes at home full of mint condition uh ko magazines oh is that right from the 80s yeah yeah i I, i'm sort of a encyclopedia of of boxing i don't i don't know much about anything else but i've always loved boxing do you keep up with uh a lot of the fighters and things like that still or do you do you watch more oh yeah yeah i I, I keep up with boxing as much as i can absolutely yeah uh it's it's not the magical era it used to be i don't think but it's there are some wonderful fighters out right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you grew up as an athlete, though. I mean, that's not the only sport you were involved in. Is that right? Oh, I was a well, you know, like I, I played a little bit of football, but I wasn't very good at that. Um, I didn't like the ideas of bigger guys running into me. There was no weight class. So <laughs> I like the boxing because I get to fight somebody my same size. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, where, what did you did you did you start off in music? Did you start off with boxing? Did you do these? Were you interested in both as a as a kid? Well, did you? My 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 father was a Pentecostal preacher, so I grew up singing in church. That's where I started. But my uncle, uh, who was a a boxer, who uh, re- relocated back to Mississippi after living in Los Angeles, where he was a uh, he was a boxer himself. He, he was he had like an eight and one record, and uh, but he didn't become you know a champion or anything like that. But he started training me when he moved back to Mississippi, and I, he my uncle was the one that got me started in boxing, and he just uh, showed me about that whole world, you know, and uh, you know I the the one thing I don't like is Wikipedia is not right. My boxing, my professional boxing record was I had 14 wins and four losses. That's, that's, that is, the, what happened on Wikipedia is not accurate. Uh, and um, uh, I got to uh, fight uh, one of the greatest fighters who ever lived. Uh, after I won some fights in succession, I got, I got rated uh, number nine in the NABF, which got me a, a shot at fighting uh, Roberto Duran. And, uh, and uh, you may have heard of him. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I went, you know, I went and watched the fight, of course, when, when we saw that. And Julie had, you know, Julie had mentioned you to me before, I think, when he had played here at some point. He's played here a Tulsa, few times, yeah. right? And uh, so I went back and watched the fight, of course. And then, I, you know, I looked up on Box Rec. And did you, did you do any amateur boxing before you went? Yeah, pro- I had, as, a, as an amateur, I had, I had 27 wins and three losses. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I, yeah, and, I, I don't know where they, you know, I don't, it's, it's frustrating because I know so many boxers that their records are not accurate on boxing rec. Sure. It's just not, you know, because a lot of fights are, were, were called like smokers where there weren't any sanctioning committees or, yeah. but a lot, a lot of guys that fought never got credit for all the fights. 
and that's and I'm a, a victim of that too. They got me like a nine and it's nine and something, but it's, it's wrong. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know I've seen it happen before too. Even with even with their commission here, um, you know, put a put entries in wrong or not put them in at all. And I think it has a lot to do with commissions. You know, when you get to a state like New York or LA or something where they have a real strong you know, a big commission that has a lot of professionalism behind it that you get those things logged in better. And I, th I think sometimes it's just a commission thing too. You know, where they just don't, they didn't have the staff or they don't follow up to, especially I'm in, you know, for a long time in Mississippi and some, some of these Southern states like Oklahoma and uh, Texas, I think it's kind of like the wild west for a while when it came to boxing commissions too. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah. when I, when I looked at your record, it was really interesting because I mean, I've, I've trained a lot of fighters, built a lot of fighters, of course. And, you know, you get to the, to today and everybody's trying to protect these guys so much. And when I look at your record, they put you out there some pretty stiff competition, like right away, you fought some, some experienced guys, like right off the bat. Yeah, I did, you know, and, and, uh, well, you know, I was, you know, pretty good, good enough to get where I got, but, uh, I never, uh, had the mentality it takes, I don't believe to be a champion. And what I mean by that is, the, like when I fought Duran, uh, the advantage he had over me was he truly, truly was able to relax under extreme pressure. You know, like in any sport, uh, you know, basketball, golf, football, the ones that are really great are the ones that can relax yeah. while they're doing their job. And, you know, when I went in there with Duran, uh, you know, obviously I was a little bit intimidated to say the least, and uh, and when I when the fight started, I felt like in 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 hindsight, I'm a, I was actually a lot better fighter than I showed in that fight. It's just my nerves were so high, and I was I was so over, overcame with nervousness. When you're that nervous, it's really hard to do what I said a minute ago. Relax, and uh, and uh, he took me to school, man. My uncle uh, gave me some great advice on how to beat Duran. And this is the way to beat Duran. You have, you cannot go to him. He's a, he's a count. He's a master counter puncher. Mm -hmm. you, you have to let him come to you. You know, like the first time he fought Sugar Ray Leonard, Leonard made the mistake of going and brawling with Duran and he got clobbered. And then the next fight, he figured out you got to make Duran come to you, peck him with the jab and move around and get him frustrated because he cannot fight going forward as good as he can going fighting backwards. So the first round of my fight, I did what my uncle said. I, I waited. I probably threw maybe two or three punches the whole round. But he had so much experience, and I was so green, that by the second round, my naivete and ego was saying, I got to go in there and do something. I got I to rough it up with this guy. And I made the mistake of going to him. And it was just like my uncle said. He started pot shotting me, man. And and the, and the thing about him, man, that people don't understand. They think he's a big puncher, and he is. But you know, a guy in a bar is a big puncher. That don't mean nothing if you can't land it. But what made him special, in my opinion, was he was incredibly hard to hit. His, yeah. defense, his defense was just impeccable. I mean, you could he, he he could read your mind about what punch you were fixing to throw. And he would just make you miss all night. And, you know, he was a master defensive fighter. And, and uh, after the fight, I, I, I gave him great respect. But now I did get some punches in, and we had to ride to the hospital in the same ambulance. Yeah, and, I thought uh, you, you had some success uh, for sure. Um, yeah, I did. I, actually, there, I can't remember exactly where it was, but I did hurt him one time i hit him with a good left hook and spun his wig around and uh and he even came to me when i was being sewed up in the dress at the hospital when i was being sewed up after he got sewed up he came into my room where i was getting sewed up and he he said man you caught me with that left hook he said that, that was a good punch but when i caught him with that one punch he was smart enough that instead when i dazed him he grabbed me yeah, because he was he was because he needed a few seconds to clear his head. But that was the only punch I landed that was significant. The rest that's, of the time, it, it, it so was much just, of that's with the experience. I mean, like you're saying with the relaxing and oh yeah, man, you know, he's 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 seen it all before, and the yeah. thing you may see for your first time in there. He's 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 already seen him a 
so many times. And that, that experience in boxing just makes a world of difference. I mean, I tell you, I, I tell you what else makes a world of difference. You know, I grew up in a household where I had food on my table. Uh, I never had to sleep out on the street. I had a nice warm bed to sleep in. So I was like, you would think of me as like a domesticated dog, all right? <laughs> all right, so you look at Duran, on the other hand, he had to literally go steal to eat. And sometimes to make, to make money when he was a kid, he would fight street fights for these rich men who would give him quarters. And I'm saying all that to say was he was not domesticated. He was like a wolf, man. He, you know, and like in, in the animal kingdom, you know, a, a, a wolf, has 10 times more crushing power than a German shepherd does. And the reason for that is the wolf has to kill to eat. And all the, all the, uh, the, the little German shepherd has to do is wag his tail. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why the wolf's tougher. And so Duran was a wolf and I was a domesticated <laughs> German shepherd. Yeah. But how is that so different? I mean, I've seen you perform and I understand that physical violence aspect of it, but I've seen you perform in front of enormous crowds. And if you're nervous, I've never seen that. You're so relaxed and you're so good with the audience. That's one of the great things about you as a performer. How's, so what is this difference? Well, the thing I lacked in boxing, which was relaxation and believing in myself fully, I have it when I'm on stage singing, you know, cause, uh, all my life, ever since I was two years old, uh, my father and my family, we would sing at church. And you know, think about that. You're a little kid and you get a microphone and you're standing in front of people and you're singing. And, and so I'm ingrained in, a, I'm comfortable being in front of people doing what I do because I've been doing it since I was two years old. Now, if Duran wants to challenge me to a singing contest, <laughs> bring it on, Mono State Piagra. Well, I was fixing, I was fixing to say, I mean, there's not, once you've been in the, across the ring with Ber, Roberto Duran, there's not very many other things I don't think is going to make you <laughs> nervous at, at this well, point. Well, a lot of, yeah, a lot of men say to me, you got whooped by Duran. I say, yeah, I did, but I didn't get whooped by you. <laughs> yeah. Because you can't whoop me. <laughs> I can be whooped, but not by you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's what I tell. <laughs> so what did your dad think about a career in boxing? Was that at odds at all with the church or was that an issue? No, it wasn't at odds with the church. It was, uh, uh, mainly they were just afraid for my safety. You know, my mother would come to the fights and, and she would sit there, which she would get so nervous and scared for my safety that she would, uh, you know, she would, uh, she would have a red rash break out on her chest and her face, and she was worried about her boy, you know, and it was hard for them. I mean, think, I don't want to go watch my children get beat up. Do you? That's tough. But it, <laughs> it's, I, it, I'm, I'm glad I was never a coach that was a like a father-son team or yeah. you know, some of these guys. That's got to be a tough position to, yeah. to be in while you're training your kids to be in such a yeah. brutal sport, you know. And you got other kind of fighters. They call them gym fighters. They're fighters that in the gym sparring with eight, with the bigger gloves and the headgear, they look like world champions. Mm -hmm. But when but when them lights is on you and you're in that ring and you know you've walked all the way down the aisle and you got your entourage around you and they're all patting you on your back saying, you know, you can do it. And we no, they're saying we can do it. I don't know why they're saying we can do it. Yeah. They ain't getting in there. <laughs> Cause when you get in the ring, they stand in there for a few minutes, but then they all get out. Yeah. And it's you and that other guy and one other man that's going to try to keep order. Yeah. That's, that, that's scary, man. I mean, I have, I have never been in the ring when I have not been scared. I, I don't, you know, even Duran, as great as he was, I have to think deep down, he had a little bit of fear, a little bit of fear towards me because, you know, he was the better man, but, and he was able to control his fear better than me, but I guarantee you he was scared too. Yeah, for sure. I think, uh, I mean, I've never seen a fighter that wasn't scared when they go to the ring. I think a little bit yeah. of it's a good thing. I mean, it drives you to be sharp and, and it, it, it drives you to train and drives you to, yeah. I'm sure just the same with music. I mean, that's what's going to drive you to practice. I mean, you're, yeah. you got to practice where you don't go on the stage and make a mistake. And, you know, those fears of doing those things is, I think, what is a big motivator in most right. in life. Right. Right after I lost to Duran in his next fight, he, he, fought Iran Barkley. Do you remember that? I, I know that he fought Barkley, but I don't remember the fight. I, well, okay. Well, after, right after he fought me, he fought Iran Barkley, who was probably 20, 20 times heavier than him and just bigger than him. And, and Duran won. 
Yeah. His very next fight, he won the middleweight championship. And that's a lot, also considering his natural weight is 135 pounds. Yeah. But he was so talented that he could actually go gain weight and be actually fat in the ring and beat guys that were way bigger than him. That's, that's how special he was. Yeah, and, he was, and I ran Barkley was a hard hitter. I mean, he had a lot of power, too. And I mean, he had, yeah, he was one. He was a notorious tough guy, no yeah. doubt about it. Yeah. But he did the same. He made the same mistake I made. He tried to go in there and r- rough Duran up because he thought he was bigger. And Duran just whooped him like a child. Well, that's another thing Duran is good at is getting you into his fight. I mean, he even took one oh, of those yeah. rates, like you mentioned earlier, Sugar Ray Leonard, and got him to fight yeah. his fight. You know, and, yeah, he did. Before the first fight, he was calling. Uh, he he said he told Sugar Ray Leonard that his wife was a whore. Yeah. And all this, he just he got did to, all these yeah. things and get it under his skin. And and he he's a he's something, man. And, you know, even even though I lost, uh, it is something I am very proud of because not not too many people can say they got to even get in there and try, you know? So well, it's, you a, it's did a, good. It's not, I mean, you, you made you, what was it the sixth or seventh round? I mean, yeah, look, I was, I felt great. The only problem, the only reason they stopped the fight is I, ha- I had a horrific cut. My, my lip was split all the way up to my nose. Yeah. You could pull, you could pull my lip in, in two different parts in two different ways. It was just, it was so, it was the worst cut maybe I've ever seen him. Well, those guys like him, they know how to cut you with those gloves. They know how to turn them over on the ends of them. And that's another thing that comes yeah. from experience. And, and yeah, to, with your, to your point with his defense, you know, a lot, I think a guy like Duran, I saw it a lot with even Julio Cesar Chavez. They let those punches come in and they glance them off the top of their head and they barely turn with them and they catch them at the last minute. And they make you feel like, you can land those shots. They make you feel like they can be hit. And, you know, they're not making you miss so bad that it's embarrassing to miss. They're letting those punches come in and make some kind of contact a lot of times. And you feel like, yeah. oh, I'm getting to them, I'm getting to them. And really you're you're playing right into their hands. You're not doing oh, it. Mean, oh, yeah. D- Duran had this thing where he would when, – when he would – when you would punch him, he would move with the direction of the punch. Mm-hmm. And, and, it, and it, even though you hit his face, it did absolutely no damage. Yeah. Because he was – he was running with the punch and man, uh, there's so there's, there's, you know, even this day, I proudly wear my Roberto Duran t-shirt and, uh, you know, I, and people say, why do you want to wear that? He whooped you. And I'd say, well, if you can whoop me, I'll wear your shirt. Well, and with boxing, people don't get, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bo- boxing, I don't think people understand the, you know, the respect that comes in between the two athletes in the sport. I mean, I don't see it as much in some of the other combat sports, but when I look at boxing, there's so much respect there, and it's brought up from the amateur side because especially when you're a, a kid coming up, maybe you go to the, all these fights and three and four and five of them, you don't even have anybody, anybody there to box. You know, you get there and mm-hmm. there's an opponent, and you did all this training, and you have nobody to share the ring with. So I think as, as a boxer and you get there and you're looking across the ring at somebody, you're almost thankful that they're there too, that you actually have somebody there to display your skills with because – Boxing is such a lonely sport. You spend so much time in the in the gym and so much time in the ring where nobody's around watching, and then you get these few minutes of time, especially in the amateurs where you're fighting, you know, three three minute rounds, and you have this little section of time to to show off your skills. And you're thankful to that other person that's trying to knock you out to be there in the ring with you. Otherwise, you're just training for nothing. I wouldn't say I'm thankful they're trying to knock me out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just. You know, anybody that hasn't ever boxed should should maybe have one fight. Yeah. You know, because I can't. You can't describe walking down the aisle. Uh, you know, it's 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 a, it's a it's a very scary feeling that uh, I think everybody should at least have one fight at least. So, how did you did you come to just a point where you knew you didn't want to do this anymore? Or well, that's a good question. Uh, when I lost to Duran, I had three fights after that, and I won them all, but they were also against lesser opposition. And it just, I just came to a point where I realized that I had did all I could do. I was good, but I was not great. And so for me to stay in, knowing that it would just make me an opponent for somebody to beat up. And so I, I just, uh, and plus I had something to fall back on. I had another talent, you know, uh, 
a lot of fighters keep fighting too long because they don't know what else to do. You know, you know like Iran Barkley, great as he was, you know. Well, even Duran, I'll also say Duran. Duran fought too long, and then towards the end of his career, he was, he, he was getting beat by guys that he could have whipped with one hand, yeah. you know, 10 years ago. And, uh, and he, you know, when he, luckily he didn't wind up with slurred speech or anything, and I think that's probably because of his defensive skills. He, he didn't really get, hard, get hit hard until uh, the end of his career when his reflexes were gone. And, uh, yeah, they, 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 do, they keep doing it because they don't, they, they don't, have, they don't have anything else they can do. Like, like another example, Roy Jones. You know, one of the greatest fighters who ever lived. Toward the end, he was getting beat by guys who were just ordinary, and not just getting beat, getting knocked out. Sure. And I wor I worry for his health. And uh, by the way, did you know him and Mike Tyson is fixing to do an exhibition? Yeah, well, he's going to ask you what your pick was. Yeah, what do you think about <laughs> well, that? Well, this is what I think. Well, first of all, they're clearly past their prime, both of them. My concern is is this. Mike Tyson is a heavyweight, my, a natural heavyweight. Roy Jones is not a natural heavyweight. Yeah. And Roy Jones has been seriously knocked out more than once. Like three or four times, he's been knocked unconscious. And he is, my fear is that it's not going to be an exhibition. And at some point, Mike Tyson's going to throw a punch that could literally end his life. Yeah. I, mean, we're not, I mean, we're talking about one of the hardest punches that ever lived hitting a middleweight, basically, who's way past his prime. You know, he, he might have the weight on him now, but it's it's not muscle weight. Yeah. Roy, 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 I'm, I'm a, I fear for Roy. I, I really do. I mean, I, th I feel he could get seriously hurt. I hadn't yeah. heard many people talk about that. But that's, that. you know, yeah, Tyson's shot. He don't have no legs. His reflexes are gone. But he can still hit. A, yeah, the power is the last thing to go. It's the last thing to go. And trust me, he can hit just as hard now as he did when he was in his prime. I, he can hit. And I just don't want to see Roy get hurt. That's, that's my concern. What do you think? Well, yeah, that's, that's my same opinion of it. I mean, if, it, if, it, if it's a true exhibition, then part of me is like, yeah, these guys are do That's what totally they know. Let them do it and yeah. have fun. But I, I think, I think what will happen is, is I think Roy will go in there exhibition and you know, playing a little bit and he'll start landing a few shots and, Tyson will go out of exhibition mode. <laughs> yeah. I think well, he'll get on gear. Yeah. And the other thing, when uh, Roy Jones fought, he he did not really fight with traditional technique. He had a gift. No, he had a gift. You, you know what I'm talking about. Yep. He could do things that were technically wrong, but he was so talented and quick, he could get away with it. But when your reflexes die, as they did, you see what happened to him. And the other advantage that Mike Tyson has is he has basic fundamentals. Hands up, move your head. It's it's the te it's it's the fundamentals of boxing that will save you even when your reflexes are gone. But Roy Jones, on the other hand, he's he's so vulnerable now. I, like to I your, said, I, to your point, I mean that that that's the difference I think between somebody like Roy Jones and a Bernard Hopkins. I mean. That's Bernard exactly Hopkins right. Has all of those skill sets to fall back on after that athleticism's gone, and that's right. And he lasted. Uh, uh, Bernard Hopkins lasted a lot longer than Roy sure. did, you know, because once Roy's uh, reflexes betrayed him, I mean, he wasn't just getting beaten; he was getting knocked unconscious. Yeah, he just that's turned, that's, he just turned into an average human when the when that's that, and that's dang, and that's dangerous, and that's it's. I just hope Mike just pulls his punches. That's all I, I say. Yeah. You know, I don't think he can knock Mike uh, Roy. I don't think he can knock Mike out. I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't think their power is there for that. So, nope. Uh -uh. Nope. I think it'll just it'll it'll be a fight of how 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 cool they can keep their heads, you know. And if it gets out of control, then Roy's in in some dangerous territory for sure. I think. On another note, I tell you who really impresses me is Tyson Fury. Oh my God! Yeah, he's phenomenal. How's a the oh guy God. like that build a move that well? That's what I'm saying. You know, the, people are going to call this blasphemy, and, but I'm going to say it anyway. Because of his size and talent, I, he might be the best heavyweight of all time. Well, I and think – I think, I really, I'm sorry. The reason I'm saying it, Muhammad Ali was great, but the problem is he was not big. Mm -hmm. 
You see what I'm saying? A, a big guy, a big good guy always beats a, a good little guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just think, I just think he's, a, he's amazing. I mean, he's amazing. I've never seen a heavyweight, a heavyweight that moves like a middleweight. And, and he has that thing where I talked about with Duran. You talk about somebody that can relax. I mean, yeah. when, when he was going in there against Deontay Wilder the first time, you know, uh, he didn't give a crap how hard Deontay fought. I could hit. He just went in there and said, I'm here. And then when yeah. he got up, when he got up on that last round, that was a, that was something I can't even put into words. You know, when he got knocked down on that yeah. last round? Yeah, I mean, that and was. Then, and then the second fight, he just whooped him like he caught him with his girlfriend. I mean, yeah. he just whooped him. <laughs> I mean, he did it so easily. And, and well, first of all, De Deontay Wilder, he has a punch, but very little else. He yeah. didn't have very much skill. Well, I but, think when you take somebody like Tyson Fury, the skill set's there. Like you said, they have so many more tools in their toolbox. But oh it also God. shows you that boxing IQ and the fact that he's still getting better. So he took a fight like that and improved off of it. He took it back to the gym and, and yeah. worked on the things, the mistakes he had made and figured out a different game plan to make the fight easy for him. And the, the only other person I really see do that that maturely in boxing right now would have been Floyd Mayweather. He he, If you even came close to him the first time, when you fought him again the second time, he would blow you out. And he, But what, you know what? Even, even he needs to think about not – well, the st he's still doing things, but he's – He's a he's a bit of a bully, you know. Yeah. If you're gonna if you're gonna fight an MMA fighter, fight an MMA fight an MMA. He he, yeah. he always makes sure everything's in his favor. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, he didn't have to train to beat Conor McGregor. Yeah, that's but, like easy. But on the other hand, if if they stepped in the octagon, Conor McGregor would twist him up like a pretzel. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know, it's two different sports. Yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. I always say boxing's like figure skating and MMA's like yeah. hockey. They're both on skates, but they're completely yeah, two yeah. different sports, you know. Yeah, you do not want to mess with one of those guys. Boxers, boxers don't have a chance in MMA. They don't have a chance. Well, they're just going to grab your leg and take you down. We put all yeah. that weight on our yeah. front foot, and yeah. you know, we're bobbing and weaving. We're going to move in the kicks, and those guys are – if they can grab that leg, they're just going to grab your leg and take you down, so. Yeah, yeah, but I got to give it to Floyd Mayweather. He's 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 great. There ain't no doubt about it. You talk about somebody with a ring IQ. Woo! Yeah, phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. and everybody, nobody ever. You know what? In a, he kind of like it goes back to what I was saying. Everybody made this. Everybody had the same strategy when they fought him. Get go to him and rough him up. That is the stupidest scat strategy. It's the same mistake I made with Duran. They love, he loves, Floyd Mayweather loves it when you come to him. He loves it. That shoulder roll, he's waiting yeah. on it, man. And he's going to beat you. He's going to pot shot you all night. There is, I can't think of, I can think of two fighters in history I think could beat Floyd Mayweather. I think Thomas Hearns could beat him. Remember Thomas Hearns? Yeah, yeah. Hearns has a lot, would have a lot of range on him. Right, right. Well, do you remember when he fought Wilfred Benitez? I don't remember that fight, but I've watched a lot okay. of fights. Okay. Well, yeah. uh, uh, Thomas Hearns always beat boxers. He, yeah. He was all. Yeah. He always beat. And the other person I think could beat him was an was a an amateur boxer who went, well he was the greatest amateur of all time, but he also became a welterweight champion. Was Mark Breland? Yeah. Mark, did, did you ever see I him had, fight? Yeah, yeah, I did. I yeah. think Mark Breland could beat him. Yeah, but he's he's he became a great coach too after yeah yeah so yeah yeah he's he's was a Deontay Wilder's coach mm -hmm. still, he, still he's is stopped, he stopped the fight last time and I think that's right that's right I think Wilder in his, yeah in his day he was he was something man yeah yeah he was six foot two and 147 pounds wow he looked like a skeleton with a wig on <laughs> <laughs> How you um, got around to giving up or choosing to leave boxing, was that when you started pursuing your music sort of more? Because I know I've read at least, and again, maybe it's a Wikipedia error, that you did like actually make some money. I mean, it was some income to you boxing at that time. So was there a need to replace that or did you just decide I'm going to go? No, let me clear something up. In boxing, the only people that make real money <laughs> are the, no, I'm serious, are the, are the, uh, 
are the, the, the high contenders and the champions. You know, when I fought Duran, I don't mind telling you this, but uh, when, when I fought Duran, I was coming in, I wasn't a household name. It wasn't like Duran versus Leonard. It was like Duran versus Paul Thorne, question mark. You know, yeah. it was like nobody knew I was. So you take, when you're an opponent, you take the fight for low money, but, the, but what you're betting on is if you win, then the next time you'll get a big payday, you know? And so, you know, um, I literally got paid, uh, I got paid $6,000 for the opportunity and all my expenses paid. But I swear to God, I'm not making this up. I had not long before the fight, I had, I had bought a trailer, an old beat up trailer. You know, I was starting out young and lean and, uh, and, uh, and, and you know how much that trailer costs? I swear to God. Six thousand dollars. <laughs> so when I got beat up by Duran, I was able to pay my trailer off. Yeah. So I won. Well, and there's—I mean, <laughs> even with that, I mean, that, that's even—you know—the sad part about boxing is even that six thousand dollars is pretty good money. Absolutely, man. Back in a back yeah. in a, back in '88, you know, like I said, I was—you know—I uh, wasn't uh, living off boxing. I was doing—I was fighting fights, you know. But I had a day job too. I worked in a furniture factory slash wrote songs at night slash uh, played uh, my acoustic guitar in pizza restaurants around town in Tupelo. You know, I, I know what it's like to start from nothing, man. And yeah, I made some money in boxing, but I didn't make near enough to live off of, you know, uh, not at all. Yeah. And I mean, most, probably 90% of the boxers out there or more probably don't maybe, maybe 95% of them don't. Yeah. Well, when I fought Duran, he got $250,000. Yeah. See, but they can, but when you're an opponent, they got you by the balls, man. You're going to yeah. take that opportunity. I would have took the opportunity if they said, we're just going to pay you $500. I was sure. going in there. I was trying to make something out of myself and move ahead. But, you know, it didn't work out that way. But it still, but it worked out great. I have so, I learned so much from boxing. I learned the importance of being prepared, you know, get in the morning, do your road work, you know, d discipline, you know. And uh, it's a wonderful sport. It is. You know, a lot of people now, they, uh, uh, they have these little boxer size classes where you don't really fight anybody. You yeah. just punch mitt. You punch mitt. It's a great workout. You know, punch the mitts, jump the rope, do some road work. It's a great workout. Uh, and there's no, you know, you can study boxing. You don't necessarily have to get in there and actually do it, but you can learn the fundamentals, you know, left jab, right cross hook. You can, it's a great thing to learn. Yeah. Well, speaking of uh, your, your music and what you're doing, doing now, I mean, maybe we already hear a song. Yeah, I'd love to hear a song. Are you okay? Yeah. You know, I got a new album. I, I recorded a new album in January, but when the pandemic started, we we were gonna well, we were originally gonna release it in July, but uh, because of the pandemic, we're not gonna release it till this thing clears up. Because to promote it, an album, you have to tour, and I can't do that right now. But this is a title cut off my record. Uh, it's called "It's Never Too Late to Call." Uh, this came. This song came from. Uh, phone conversations I had with my sister late at night who passed away about a year ago and she was the only person in our family that that stayed up late and so when I would get through with my shows I would call her and we'd have conversations and and uh this is a song about that Get intoxicated to forget about what's wrong. If you feel like a sparrow who's fallen, you're not alone. When you're wearing concrete shoes at the bottom of a lake, and it feels like your heart can't take another break. Just remember that I love you and it's never too late to call. You say you have parts that are broken from your heart down to your soul. But I see a jewel in the gutter. To me you shine. Like gold when you're 
Wearing concrete shoes at the bottom of the day. And it feels like your heart can't take another break. Just remember that I love you and it's never too late to call. When you can't turn off the voices in your head My phone stays on the nightstand by my bed When you're wearing concrete shoes at the bottom of the day And it feels like your heart can't take another break just remember that i love you and it's never too late to come no it's never too late to come never too late to come no it's never too late to come Yeah, fantastic. That was beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I want to hear a little bit more, if you can share a little bit more about the album. Did I hear, is your daughter, did she perform on this album too? And maybe, or I know she's a singer as well, right? Yeah, my, my oldest daughter, a kid, she's a singer. She's actually, she's the best singer in the Thorn family, to be honest with you. She, she can sing me under the table, man. She's it's incredible. She just, when she was a little girl, she, I would just heard her in a, in a room just belting out, sound like a, a Aretha Franklin. I mean, she's got that kind of quality. And uh, anyway, yeah, uh, she sang, uh, well, she, she sang background vocals on a song on the new record uh, that she and I wrote together. When she was about, when she was about 12 years old, uh, she uh, wanted to, she got into the Beatles and, uh, she wanted to write a song with me and she wanted to write a song. And she said, Dad, let's write a song like the Beatles. I said, well, that's a pretty hard task to do. <laughs> they wrote some good ones. So, but we wrote a song together and uh, she, yeah, she's singing on my record. She sang background vocals on the record, yeah. Was that pretty fun? I can't imagine, I mean, that must have been wonderful to work together. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun, uh, you know. I'm I'm proud of her. She's really uh, she's really she teaches music in New Orleans. That's what she does for a living. Yeah, oh wow! Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, the pandemic, have you spent a lot? I mean, that's a pretty. I've heard other stories like that. Ready to go in January and just everything's kind of shut down. Have you spent a lot of this time being creative? Where have you turned to? I know you've done some live streams, but how else have you used this time? Because you really tour a lot, and everything just kind of ground to a stop. Well, um, actually, I've been, first of all, I'm going to say, even though it's been a bad situation, I've enjoyed getting to be home and just getting to do things like, uh, you know, go to the Friday night football game at the high school, you know, or go to my daughter's soccer game and just just do normal stuff like carry the trash can out to the road, you know, and just uh, I'm enjoying that. But, yes, I, uh, to answer your question, uh, I've, do, I've done a few live uh, web shows, you know, concerts on the internet and um I, I do artwork and i've been doing a lot of artwork and uh you know i'm I, i'm I, i'm enjoying being off right now you know uh could i keep this up for a couple more years no i couldn't but the money would run out but you know that's uh but i'm okay right now i'm doing good you mentioned your art and did that start at the same time as your music? Because you really are a very talented artist. And I don't, is that a big part of what you pursue too? Or is it just incidental to the music? Um, I don't really, the, the art is the one thing I don't do. I just do art for me. I think everybody needs something that they do for themselves, something that makes them feel good. And, and you know, I, was, I guess I was blessed with an artistic ability and I do art. Yeah, I do. I, I do art. And it's, uh, I don't, I've had a few, I've sold art and stuff, but I don't really do art thinking about I'm going to sell it. I just do art because I just want to do it, you know? It's, it's funny, you you know, with, with you and the music and the boxing and the art, because I've been coaching now, I think, for 11 or 12 years, and I, I've got an, a, 
I've, I've drawn and paint and I've got some artistic ability about me. I never did anything with music, of course, but I've seen so many fighters and so many boxers in the gym that do have artistic ability or that play instruments. I've even used analogies between how you learn boxing and how you pick up an instrument, you know, to, to break down the understanding of it, even from, you know, the 10,000 hour rule that still applies. And, um, you know, learning basic punches is like uh, learning a node and then you learn a chord. And so you're learning combinations and then you get a little bit better and you want to perform with somebody. So you got to get in the ring and spar and then you get a little better at that. And now you want to go get on stage and, and you have to work on your, um, you know, your performance and your, your, your stage persona, you know? So there's just, there's so many different things there that I think that comes along with, with boxing, being an individual sport and music and, uh, um, art kind of been that, uh, still a kind of an all ind- individual concept, even though you, even though you're playing with the band or even though you're sharing the ring with, a uh, another boxer, it's, uh, there's so, there's so much that just kind of all makes sense together on how that process of learning happens. And, I don't know what it is with the boxing, but there, we, we do seem to have an, an odd number of artists in the gym or musicians in the gym that come in here and box as well. Yeah, you know, Floyd Mayweather Sr. is actually an incredible portrait artist. Did you know that? I didn't know he – I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, he's he, a, oh, man, he can paint. He can paint. And, uh, and he, you know, who he, he, he likes to paint uh, uh, Elvis. Oh yeah, he's a, big, he's a big Elvis. Floyd. I'm talking about Floyd made with the scene. Sure. Yeah, yeah he, 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 but he, he, he did a great portrait of Elvis, and uh, but he's he's a great artist. And uh, 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 somebody else was. I think it might have been Joe Frazier was a, a, an artist as well. Yeah. Yeah, and there was a one of the fights I was watching here a few weeks ago. They were talking to one of the boxers, and they were showing his art. And then Alan Green is here in our gym, and he he's an artist and likes to ride. And um, I've trained two or three different boxers that were that were really decent uh, guitar uh, players and they put a lot of time into music and um, they never really did anything with as far as their career was concerned, but you know, that's what they did on the, for their hobby, you know, outside boxing and they were, and they were talented at it. You know, that, that talent seems to, to to some reason go kind of hand in hand. I don't know why, but. I don't know either. You know, um, it's a, I think I'm, I think I'm, you ever be fixing to say something and you forget what you think? Yeah. That's, what just ha- <laughs> that's what just happened to me. And that, that's from being a boxer before. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but, uh, you know, I know lots of boxing trainers, and uh, in every boxing trainer's dream is to, is to have a certain kid walk in the door that's special, you know. You, can, you know, you can train 10 boys, and they're not, but they're not all going to be special. Yeah. Maybe none of them will be special, but, but you know, just just like you know, when Roberto Duran was a kid, and they took him to the boxing gym, he had no skill at that moment, but he was such a ball of strength and tenacity from how he had had to live like a wolf for his, all the meals he got. Like I said earlier, that the, when the trainer saw him, even when he didn't know how to fight. Just when they put him in there just to see what he would do, right off the bat, they knew they had something special, you know. Yeah. And uh, Freddie Rhodes said that same thing about Manny Pacquiao, sure. who, was another, who was another kid who lived on the street yeah. and, had, and came up hard fighting for every meal. Floyd, uh, Freddie Rhodes said, man, when I put on the mitts with Pacquiao, he said it was like a dream come true. He said yeah. he was hitting those pads so hard it was hurting my hands. And he was just, he was special. Yeah, but you know, you can't get, you can't be that. You know, if you're eating, if your Fruit Loops is ready for you every morning, <laughs> yeah. you, watch, you, you can't get your mama's, you, you know, gonna put band aid on your boo boo. Those people don't make it. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's too rough of a sport. <laughs> it's too rough of a sport, man. Yeah, it ain't ping pong. <laughs> and training, I mean, in training people, I, you know, you always have in the back of your mind that you hope you get those guys. But, you know, I, I do what I do because I like boxing. It lets me yeah. be in it, you know. And yeah. we run the gym here to do, you know, like you were talking about training for fitness classes. And that's what we do to, you know, to, to pay the bills where I can do yeah. the, the things that I love. And when yeah. it comes to my artwork, I do the same with you. It's just a – it's a distraction or a stress reliever for me whenever I draw or paint. And I, I think Julie and I talked before. I, I thought one of the best things in the world I've ever seen was when they uh, – like a year – a couple of years ago, they had those adult coloring books where 
people were getting colored pencils and coloring in these coloring books, you know, and I'm like, everybody should have some kind of art. Yeah. Know, artistic outlet. I think, you know, cause it just kind of takes your mind off of every, yeah. everything else. So. I'm going to say something the world may not want to hear, but I'm, I, and I don't want to have to say it, but I be, honestly believe boxing is going to go away because, <laughs> because most of the fighters who became the ones I've been talking about, you know, the Durans, the Pacquiao, uh, most young kids coming up, well, back in that day, if they wanted to get out of poverty, they had a gym to go to. They had a trainer, a YMCA or something, and there was somebody there training, training young kids. But now the young kids are not really wanting to get out of the gutter through boxing. They're going to sports like football and basketball. And boxing is just not – I hate to say that it's not as popular as it once was. It's – MMA has just went way past it as far as popularity. You yeah. know, uh, it's just the way it is. I wish it wasn't that way, you know, because they had boxing on HBO for 30 something years. It was like a staple, you know, I've, we love to watch the the fights on HBO and now they don't have boxing at all on HBO. It's yeah. done, you know? And, and so I, I, I feel like, there will come a time when boxing will just be a sport that used to exist the way it's going right now. Well, and I, I, I see it. I see in some of it, in some areas, I think it's slowing down a lot in some areas it's, it's getting, you know, bigger than ever. I think the, the, the worst thing, the, the best and worst things about boxing, um, the things you hate about boxing are also kind of the things that's protected it a, a long for a long time. Everybody says, you know, boxing should have a, a universal commission that oversees everything to make sure fights aren't judged poorly and that the oh, yeah. boxers are better protected. But I think some of those things, I think if we had that, we would already be shut down um, because yeah. I think it's easy to shut down a large organization. I think some of the things that save boxing is that it's so hard to wrangle in because yeah. every state has its own commission. And that's right. You know, I, and so you, you have, once you, one state does one thing, you'd have to set a law in another state. And I think right. that, I think that craziness of boxing is actually what protects it um, in Maybe some so. regards. Um, you know, with, the, with the amateur kids, you know, with amateur boxing, it, it's it's become such a worldwide sport now too, and I think that saves it because just like in China, China registered more coaches last year than America registered amateur fighters. Um, but yeah. you know, and even in December with this with the tournament we have coming up, we we've, we've been breaking, we've broke records our last four tournaments for. Uh, registered uh, fighters in those tournaments uh, yeah. in the history of amateur boxing. So there's a lot of the amateur side of the sports growing up where it's becoming a problem at is like these guys all turn pro and they're wanting to protect their career so much. And you don't have those great fights like they used right. to have, you know, where everybody would just fight everybody. Now everybody's trying to pick and choose who they're going to fight. And they're more worried about the business and the money side of it, or just their appearance or how many you know likes they can get on social media and, and appearing to be a boxer on, on, on social media and looking like a fighter than they are worried about actually liking the fight. You know, you take a guy right. like Rand, he just loved to fight. I mean, yeah. that's where you don't, you got a lot of these guys that just love the idea of being a fighter. Now that's, you know, they want the idea of being a fighter and present, present themselves as a fighter more than they actually like to fight. That's a, and, that's a good and, point. That's you know, so that's where I see a big problem with it is not, it's hard to have those great fights and keep it, it, organizations like HBO interested when, you're having to play all of these. Yeah, but they're not the reason they got the reason they got canceled on HBO is because it was not popular. That's that's mm -hmm. that that is the truth. I mean, they it was not they watched they they gauge who's watching. You know, sure. people people the generations coming up just don't have the interest in it that that our generation did. Yeah. You know, they just didn't. And other other things wrong with boxing it, is. You, all right, if you want to be a professional football player, you got to go to high school, play there. You got to go maybe to college, play there, and you got to you got to be showing yourself to be great. And then you might might get asked to be in the pros. You know what you got to do to be a professional boxer? Sign your name up. <laughs> yeah. Sign your name and pay the license fee. Yep. Joe Blow from Texaco can go <laughs> in. I mean, you. I mean, seriously, anybody. Yep. This young lady here, anybody, you can go and get a license and you can be a professional boxer. It, you will be, but really all that means is you, you instead of, you're going to get paid. That's yeah. all it means. But you, you know, it's, it's, it, it needs to be sanctioned more than that because it's a dangerous sport. And if, if you get into boxing and uh, in the professionals, you should have to do like football players doing 
and and you know you have to be a boxer you can't just you know i know lots of people that that fight for five hundred dollars and they'll get knocked out uh but they don't care they, they got their professional life so and and even on the even on the almost the sadder side of that is it's, it's the same thing with the coaches i mean you just want to be a boxing coach you just start saying you're a boxing coach and put on a pair Absolutely. of and start training fighters Absolutely. Not There's like you had to go fill out a resume and get a job for the NFL. I mean, it's that is exactly right. That is exactly right. It's not sanctioned. It's it, it's 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 just running wild. You know, uh, like I said, anybody listening to this podcast, if you want to be a professional boxer, you can. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> ill advised though. <laughs> if you can write your name and you got twenty dollars, <laughs> you, you have all the opportunities. So we loved having you on today and I am um, kind of getting to the end of our time, but do you, would you play one more song for us to take it out? Okay. All right. Uh, let me see here. Let me see what I can sing here. Um, I think I'll sing that song uh, me and my daughter wrote. Yeah, that'd be great. It's called, it's, it's, this is called Sapphire Dream.
We've really enjoyed having you on. So for people that want to find out more about you, paulthorne.com. That's yeah, right. go to paulthorne.com, you know, Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. Yeah. Great. And you think all that stuff, I don't know how to work. <laughs> and as far as this next album, you're hoping just kind of wait and see. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna we're we're we're, we're uh, looking for er, towards early 2021 to put it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's, I can't. I don't advise any artist to put your record out right now because you know venues are are 25 percent. You know, you just there's it, the things are not in place that you need to have. You know, uh, you can't do it. You can't go to radio stations and talk to people. You, you know, I'm a very social person when I do my shows. I like to go out after the show and shake people's hands. And, and you know, I can't do any of that. So uh, I'm going to sit tight and try to remember where I buried those change jugs in the backyard right now. Well, you're gonna, <laughs> we can always go back to price fight and I can put you back on a – No, 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 uh-uh, no. No, I, when That's you're – gone. When you, whenever you can make it back through town, I'd love to meet you. And uh, hopefully you get to Tulsa again and this is over with soon. And Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, you know, and I wish y'all success with your program. It's very good. Well, thank I you. Like I, 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 I really appreciate that. you coming on. So we, yeah. I think we could talk about, you know, more and more of this for hours, but <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, thanks a lot, Paul. I appreciate, appreciate it. Thank you. Time, thank you, everybody. Y'all have a good one. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Engine Room Podcast with hosts Coach Aaron Sloan and Julie Watson. Brought to you by Engine Management and Promotions, I'm Susan McKinney. The Engine Room Boxing Gym in Tulsa, Oklahoma offers competition and fitness training, as well as ready-to-fight Parkinson's-specific boxing. Designed by Coach Sloan, ready-to-fight is the official therapy boxing program of USA Boxing. For more information on all of our programs, visit engineroomboxing.com.